Okay. Welcome to uh, another edition of the interviews um, with our uh, Oregonian Academy. We have a very special guest, Mark Manson, on my right. And uh, I'm glad to see you can turn out from the Academy. So this is an Academy-only invite uh, event, so um, you should anticipate some good questions. So with Mark, I'm really glad that you uh, made it out to Asia. You're doing a little yeah. Asia tour. Yeah. It's not little if you've been here for a few months. But, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, we're really lucky that you swung through the most expensive country and city in the area. Very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a contrast from like Vietnam or Thailand. Or oh, man. Here. It's huge. <laughs> oh, and it's, I came here, I was here three years ago. And just since then, it's like, oh, right. It's, it's even worse. So yeah. it's, um, it's been eye opening. That's for sure. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, six dollar Coke. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Eye opening. Ten dollar coffee that you drink in three sips. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we're glad you made it up. We're about to enter the academy, and yeah. um, I usually start off with asking you about your story. Sure. Um, and I know you have a really interesting one. You started off. Um, some of you might know him as Entropy way yeah. back in the day. That's how I first heard about you. Yeah. Uh, this was in Boston, right? This was like yeah. a Boston crew. And um, then that morphed into Practical Pickup. Yep. That was a really great blog. And now, and then you were at Post Masculine. Yeah. And recently changed into Mark Manson's yes. .net. That was much more about self development for both genders. Right. And a really healthy and mature perspective yep. on this whole area of dating and relationships. Sure. So it's it's sort of like, um, well, I know what most guys who would be watching this who would find us through Googling or whatever are probably searching for dating or pickup related terms. Mm -hmm. And um, usually at that point, if it's the first entry, they're looking for what to say, how do I uh, open. And, uh, wow. We're in West Yeah. Wah, wah. Yeah. Like that joke. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I feel like a lot of what you you've been writing the past few years is um, to me the next level of, yeah. of getting this handled or sure. um, evolution. Yeah. And ideally, you would come in at, at that point at the beginning, so you wouldn't have to waste your time right. with all the other stuff. Um, but sometimes it's a it's a necessary uh, stage in, in in some cases. And yeah. anyway, I, I've been saying a lot about about your journey, <laughs> but let's hear. For me, how did you get to the point where you're sitting here now with us? Okay. So I guess, you know, my start story starts out kind of typical as most people's. Um, was a little bit of a, a shy, nice guy growing up. Um, always the girl's best friend. Um, always getting turned down or just not having the nerve to, to ask a girl out or, or, or what have you. Um, Ended up getting my first girlfriend when I was 18 or 19, just because I think I was in a band, um, and she liked guys in a band. Uh, just fell completely, like, disgustingly head over heels for her. Um, at the time, I thought I was a very romantic, passionate guy, but looking back, uh, it was a toxic neediness, a constant need for affection and validation. So jump ahead about three years and of course she starts cheating on me and she leaves me uh and it's the breakup's just a complete disaster like go into a total tailspin stay in bed all day completely depressed uh and that's kind of that was 2005 when that happened so that's when a few months later i hopped online i'm like you know everything i thought i knew about women you know i was always the nice guy i always thought i was doing everything for her I made her the center of my world, um, and look how far that got me. So obviously I did something wrong. I should get online and start reading about it. And that's when I found the, the pickup artist stuff. So that was 2005. That was right when the game came out. And I just took to that. You know, I read the game in like two days. It's like, holy crap, man. I got to do this, you know, like started practicing my magic tricks and like, <laughs> and, um, you know, decide to start going out, you know, like, oh, this is what you have to do. You got to go approach girls, you got a DHB, you got to qualify, um, you got a neg. And uh, it was just kind of more disaster. Um, 
at least it got me talking to girls. Um, but it, it just started to kind of, the whole routine thing never worked for me. So eventually I, I, I got, uh, I, I kind of decided, you know what, I'm going to kind of do my own take on this because I could always talk to people. I always had a decent sense of humor. And so I figured, you know, girls like talking to me before I read this stuff. So maybe I should just <laughs> like, like start with being normal. Like I'll start with normal and then I'll add things to it. Like as I see problems that come up. Uh, so I did that over the course of two years and I improved very quickly. I was very active in um, a group much similar to this in Boston at the time. And I kind of just leapfrogged, you know, I, I went from like the guy who was pissing himself to even approach a girl to two years later, I was the guy with all the crazy stories and, um, you know, the one that all the guys wanted to hang out with and go out with. So I started coaching. I coached pickup. I did the whole PUA, did the PUA conferences, did the boot camps. Um, you know, did like the videos and seminars and all that stuff. Did that for about two years, uh, three years actually, two or three years. And uh, like David was saying is, I hit a point where I kind of realized, I'm like, I'm still not really that happy. Um, yeah, I'm getting laid all the time. And yeah, I can go into a club and like pick up a hot girl and, bunch of guys on the internet think I'm really cool <laughs> but I'm not actually like very happy and I, I noticed that I was still very sensitive to how people thought about me um, I was still very sensitive to what women thought about me I found that, that instead of getting more confident with myself and more comfortable with failure and rejection I was I started to discover that uh, I was actually becoming more sensitive to it and so I took some time away from pickup, um, traveled a lot, went, spent a lot of time in Europe, and kind of set out, like we were saying, it's like there needs to be another solution beyond this. Like pickup is part of the solution, but it, it can't be all of the solution. There has to be something past this. Uh, and that's where my book models came from. And that's where all of the work involving um, psychology, um, neediness, confidence, uh, vulnerability, that's where all this stuff started coming from. And so I started experimenting with it. Um, you know, go out, be vulnerable, be honest, be authentic, accept the rejection. Um, be nerdy if you're nerdy, you know, be goofy if you're goofy. And then I wrote a book about it and that just, that changed everything. So that's what brings me here today, I guess. Yeah. And um, one thing that uh, it really annoys me, and I think it, it was uh, heartening to, to read through your site and, and have that um, encouragement and support on, on this side of things, because when Americans especially hear about this part of what I do, this dating coach stuff, um, this business, that they immediately assume it's like the game. Yeah. They don't ask any other questions, like, oh yeah, you do that, you're a pickup artist. Yeah. And then they immediately turn to one of my friends, like, how do you feel about him being a pickup artist? Like, and it's just this is an assumption. And um, I know that there are a lot of differences between um, what the POA community has been doing and is doing now and what, and, and the focus of your, your work. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on that? What do you think are the major differences between, or, or even coming at it from a different way, you could say, uh, what are some of the problems with the POA community? Sure. So... Uh, what the PUA community kind of gets right is that it says that, okay, you have a problem with women. Women don't like you, and that's making you unhappy. And so it tells you, hey, you can improve yourself, and you can improve your relationships. You know, here's how you can do that. And that's a really, really important thing to put out there. I mean, I, when I read the game, that, oh, my God, I can consciously improve my attractiveness and my relationships with people. It's just something that I never really cared about or thought about or even knew it was possible. So that's really important. Where the POA community goes wrong is it says you can improve your relationships and the metric for that improvement, the metric for success, is how many girls you have sex with, how hot the girls you have sex with are, um, whether you can get a threesome or not, can you get a girl in a club or do day? All these like really superficial 
it becomes like a video game. Right. You know, it's like, yeah. do you do you have all the badges like in yeah, StarCraft? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it's um, that it's a really poor metric. Because ultimately what we're after here, what we're after here is happiness. We're after fulfilling relationships. We're, a, we're after um, feeling comfortable around women. Feeling comfortable and, and, and happy with our relationships with women. And you can't quantify happiness. You can't quantify healthy relationships. And, um, and so I think that whole community gets very lost I mean, you see it all the time. I mean, there's entire like two hundred dollar courses dedicated to how to bang a ten in in sixty minutes or less. You know, it's like who cares? Like, I used to tell my clients, I used to say, okay, you have two options: you can date a supermodel and be miserable, or you can date an average looking girl and be completely satisfied and happy. Which one would you do? And they'd be like. Do I have <laughs> 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 like it, it, it just short circuit them, you know? They'd be like, "Well, uh, <laughs> you know, obviously everybody wants both, but it's like, which one are you going to prioritize? Are you going prior to prioritize your happiness? I mean, obviously we all like hot girls, we all like the perfect yeah. ten or whatever, but like, is your happiness your? It, what's motivating yeah. your happiness? I feel like that. That's a great way of pointing out why some people have to go, some guys have to go through this phase because they don't know how to answer the question because yeah. they've never had either of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. <laughs> uh, they're like, well, I don't know how to compare them because they've never tasted that, you know, that yeah. fruit. Um, and then they go through, they usually will, will go through the supermodel or the try for that. Yeah. And then they realize it's empty and then they come around. Yeah. Um, and that is the, I mean, that was my process. I imagine that was yeah. your process. It's a lot of people's process. The only danger in that is that going the superficial route can make you more miserable so like there's some of us who kind of go that route and if you can actually get it and you're like oh i actually did bang a model and it's not that great like good great good for you but like for every guy who actually does that there's 10 who try to do that and just fail miserably and they become even more miserable yeah. for it i think that's why it's it's really great that your site's out there because really it's it's like one out of i don't know how many people are blogs or popular now it's really just that one to me that I've seen that really hits that angle. Yeah. And what you're telling guys is, look, you're going to go through this phase. This is what I, I tell guys now. You're going to go through this phase, and it's a necessary part of you. Because honestly, if you say, I'm going to turn down the supermodel, that's bullshit. Too. No, yeah, no. Because you don't really not. know what you're going to do. So you go out there, but instead of becoming really, really miserable, you realize, oh, yeah, this is thing that David or Mark was saying yeah. you know, way back. Maybe now I'm, I'm in that part of my life. Right. And it's not. And there's a there's a clarification here too that I think is important. It's not that you shouldn't go for the supermodel or shouldn't go for the perfect ten. It's just that your me, the metric of success should not be the supermodel. So like, you can aim for the supermodel, but if you miss and end up really happy with a cool girlfriend, that's not failure. Whereas like the PUA community would say, "Oh, that's failure. You settled for a seven. Fuck you." Right. You know, like <laughs> it, yeah. it's not. It shouldn't be, you know, that should be applauded. It should be like, oh, wow, you found, like, a cool seven girlfriend who makes you really happy. Like, congrats, right. you know? Like, that should be uh, admired. Right. But, you know. Or it could be your nine or ten, but that rare one who actually does contribute to your well-being. Sure. Um, that's something you might hold out for. Sure. So, um, there is a, a train of, of concepts. I think of it as leading one into the other. Mm -hmm. That... We've talked about uh, many times, and I just want to uh, go over those real quick. Cause okay. Kind of to lay the groundwork for other questions that I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, and it seems like it all starts with neediness. I remember reading Chapter 2 of the old edition of Models. We sure. still use that word, neediness instead of confidence, right? Right. And it was um, attract, a man's attractiveness is inversely proportional to his neediness. neediness. Yes. Um, can you explain? I think for – okay. So – a lot of guys in, well, everywhere in the world, but especially in this, this more, I mean, one of the reasons why Singapore is so successful materialistically is because it's materialistic. Yeah, you right, know, so right. We're talking about metrics, we're measuring success by what society tells you uh, is, are, are the metrics. So right. um, whether you have a fancy car or a condo or a certain amount of cash or whether you can get into certain places. Right. And... Um, I think that contributes to this neediness as well. Sure. So, 
Um, can you explain? Uh, well, I know this is really difficult. But <laughs> succinctly, um, what what that is for a man. So, basically, what the concept is, uh, kind of the core principle concept of my book, is the concept of neediness, and it basically the way I define it is the more a man judges himself based on other people's perception rather than his own perception, the more needy he is. So it's like if I, let's say I'm in a relationship or I'm talking to a girl in a bar or wherever, uh, if my perception of myself is based far more on how she perceives me rather than how I perceive myself, then that is neediness. Um, it has to do with priority. It has to do with what matters to you more. Does it matter to you more that what she thinks about you, or does it matter more to you what you think about you? And the argument I make throughout the book is that all unattractive behaviors come from men who prioritize another person's, the woman's perception of them. So, and then all, all attractive behaviors, everything that makes a man attractive, comes from prioritizing what a man perceives about himself. Um, so everything, dressing well, um, you know, if you dress really well because you want other people to like you, then that will eventually become apparent to people. Um, and that will become unattractive. Whereas a man who dresses well because he cares about himself and he just enjoys feeling good, that will also become apparent to people. Um, it, kind of the core idea is that over a long enough time, you can't fake people out. Like people will always see the real you eventually. Um, so that's why, and, there, and back in the, in the pickup community, there's always all these kind of like uh, debates and, and arguments over like indirect work or just direct work or, you know, DHVs, they don't work and, and all this stuff about like what lines work and what lines don't. And what completely gets ignored is why you're doing the behavior. So I can have the coolest line in the world, but if I'm saying it because I really want a girl to like me, I'm going to come off like a loser. Whereas I can have the dumbest line in the world, and if I say it because I think it's kind of funny and, you know, who cares, like I'm having a good time, uh, it will come off as attractive. So ultimately what it comes down to is, and, and what women seem to kind of be, and not just women, people, but, but in dealing with like men-women relationships, women are subconsciously wired to look at how you feel about yourself. And this is true of all people. When we meet new people, we subconsciously look to see how they feel about themselves. The way they stand, the way they laugh, the things that they say, um, the hobbies they take up. And our perception of them is based on how we believe they feel about themselves. And so if you feel really awful about yourself and you try to cover that up with all sorts of fake behaviors because you think, oh, this is what some book told me is cool, you're still going to come off as really unattractive, no matter what, you know? So, so, so let's say a guy is looking outside himself for approval to tell him whether he's good enough. Right. What steps can you take to conquer that? Because it's, if, if it's a deep-seated emotion or mm -hmm. need, um, then it's it's one thing for him to know I'm needy now, right? Right. It's another to to, to change that feeling, right? Um, so yeah, there are a lot of ways to to, to get at that, but um, I'll just throw that. In. Sure. So we all look for we all look for approval from others, and that never changes. You know, no matter you could become as you know fulfilled and enlightened or whatever you want to call it, we all still you know we like people to like us. We like being successful. We like having money, whatever. Uh, that never changes. What changes is, is that enough? Is that all there is? So the problem with most men who struggle in dating is that they base all of their perception of whether they're successful or not on how each woman responds to them. Like, oh, she flaked on me. I'm a loser. God, what did I do wrong? Here, let me post three pages on the internet. <laughs> and like, whereas a guy whose metric is himself, his own values, his own expression of his personality, will say, well, she flaked on me. Uh, I guess we weren't compatible. 
I guess my values didn't align with hers, or maybe it was right person, wrong time, and that's fine because I'm still awesome, you know? Um, so how do you get from that first place to the second place? The first way to do it is to start defining personal metrics for yourself. So one of the things that I usually recommend guys do is pick a thing that you can say to women, whether it's when you approach or on a date or whatever, uh, that you're saying it for no other reason than you believe it and you care about it. Um, because when you do it that way, it doesn't matter what her reaction is. So it's like if you actually really say you really care about the rainforest or whatever, I'm just totally making up an example. Make it a point, just as an exercise, make it a point to bring up that you think this issue is important or that you really care about it. You think it's a big problem and, hey, this is part of who I am. And most of the time, most people will be like, oh, sweet, that's nice. Um, but, you know, sometimes you'll get good responses, sometimes you'll get bad responses. But the thing is, is when you focus on things that you care about, the things that define you, things that are part of your identity, her response doesn't affect that. If she becomes really bitchy and rejects you because you care about the rainforest, you're going to be like, wow, what a bitch. <laughs> I don't want to date her. Like, I'm not calling her back, you know? <laughs> it completely flips things. You start thinking of things like, does she fit my standard? Is she good enough for my values? And it's important for guys to start developing a habit of finding that in everything they do. Because, um, and stop me if I, I just go on all night. Because um, one of the things that, that, you know, guys who struggle with this have, one of the reasons they struggle with this neediness is because they've never actually sat down and defined what their own values are. They spent, and coming back to the Singapore thing, they spent all their life getting good grades, they spent all their life getting a good job, spent all their life making mom and dad happy, spent all their life trying to make every girl happy, and they never sat down and said, what about, what do I care about? What's important to me? What defines who I am? And if you don't have that identity within yourself, you can't create your own metric for success. And if you have no metric for success, then you're going to spend all your time trying to impress chicks. And when you're trying to impress chicks, you're going to be a douchebag. So, yeah. Um, so adding on to that, let's say a guy, because you, you're, you were getting to the point where you're saying that when you have your own set of values, you live by them. Mm -hmm. You can get to the point where you say, I, because I'm awesome. That girl didn't appreciate what I have. We were not compatible. You know, there's right. nothing wrong with you. There may not even be anything wrong with her. If right. You say you're not compatible. Um, how do we get a guy to the point where he says, I'm awesome? Like, so if his love is sort of, it just sucks, right? For him, he's not proud of who he is, and he's yeah. not doing anything he's passionate about. Um, I was just reading this book that you recommended, Nathaniel Brandon's uh, Six Pillars. Yeah, Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. And one of the contributing, one of the two contributing factors to self-esteem was self-efficacy. The other was self-respect. Yeah. And efficacy was really cool, because it, what, it sort of encapsulated what we do at the academy, because... What we were trying to do for them is to think of your ideal self. If you yeah. could be your own superhero, you know, whatever, what would that look like? What right. would you want to do with your time during the day and everything? Yeah. And are you and, and how far off from that are you? And we get you moving in that direction right. at a pace that you're proud of. And um, the efficacy there is what gives you that confidence in yes. yourself. Absolutely. That you're happy with this. Now Here's an issue that I've been getting with a lot of clients. Their values don't match most hot girls in clubs' values. <laughs> you know, so like, um, you know, one guy values culture, so he's into classical music or jazz, right. or he loves reading poetry, and he goes to the club in Singapore. It's just really, in many ways, a cultural desert. You know. Yeah. So you go on there, and culture for them is last year's Jay Z song. <laughs> so you're like, not happening. Yeah. Um, but then you, you show them, hey, you know, there's some this thing called banter, this funny thing. And you and then if he if he's a good actor, he can uh, and he's quick witted, he can right. take that on. Right. What? So so here's a fundamental conflict. Like he's getting rewarded for being someone who he's not, but this person that he wants to be isn't being rewarded. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you get a lot of guys here in that trap. Like they're like, sure. I can be me and my values, but there's not like a single attractive woman who likes what you know, World of Warcraft. Really <laughs> so yeah, they get rewarded, but it's a short-term reward. Uh, 
and often a long term headache. Uh, because this is this is the thing is is relationships that are built on superficiality, on banter, uh, and not on values. They're not good relationships. Either they just don't last, or and you've got to go back to the club two weeks later and find another one, uh, or you just it's they're painting the ass to talk to, they're painting the ass to listen to, um, and you kind of just sit there and wait it out <laughs> until you get to stick your penis in them, and, and and so it's not like it can be fun and exciting, but like it's not uh, it's not it doesn't it's sh- it, like you said, it doesn't reflect their values. And so I, I think guys like that, like you said, the guy who likes chat, jazz and poetry, and yet he's trying to you know, pick up some drunk bimbo in a club, uh, it, you have to ask yourself, what, <laughs> what do you really want? Like perhaps your perception of, or perhaps your perception of what is good for you or what you actually want isn't what you think. Because our generation in particular, we have been subjected to a massive amount of social pressure to be the cool popular guy in the club and be the guy with the hot girl on your arm and be, um, you know, banging hot girls left and right. And, you know, from everything from porn to the sleazy reality TV to all the consumer stuff to, to beer commercials. I mean, it just goes on and on. And so the thing is, is that a lot of men in our generation have kind of just tacitly accepted that uh, in game, that goal, without actually paying attention to what they actually want. That perhaps that girl in the club, she's not going to make you happy. You might have fun for a couple nights, and that's cool if you want to have fun. But like, uh, if she doesn't match your values, then then it's not something you want. And again, a lot of times guys have to go figure that out. You know, it's like I used to obsess about the hot trashy club girl and after a couple of years i started banging them and i'm like this sucks yeah. <laughs> like I, I this is just like i you know it's a really unhealthy lifestyle so sometimes guys have to figure that out but sometimes you know i i i, I really kind of have like long heart-to-heart talks with guys like look if you want to be promiscuous and do the party thing that's one thing and sure banter or whatever can get you there but if you're talking about like life happiness life fulfillment all that stuff um, then you really need to be honest with yourself, you know, because because a lot of the a lot of these guys just develop these really unrealistic standards. Like, I want a girl who's a supermodel who has a PhD and <laughs> knows the difference between Shostakovich and Tchaikovsky. And like, <laughs> it's like, dude. <laughs> oh, and she's twenty one and yeah. Russian. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, so, um. It, it, it's uh, it's important to kind of take a hard look at like, is this something I want for me, or is this something I want because I've been told this will make me a cool guy, this is what society tells me I want, this is what my friends will be impressed by, and look at that honestly. Okay, so um, what you're getting at, I could just go into for a really long time. If we have enough time, uh, time, we'll come back to it. Okay. Let me just take it to a more general direction. Um, for the guys who get this handle, who, who do, who improve at a, at, at a rapid rate versus the guys, you know, there are plenty of them in these layers all over the world who spend one or two years studying pickup and everything they can get their hands on online and they don't go anywhere or it mm-hmm. gets worse. Right. Right. What, what do you think of the, would account for the guy who succeeds in this area, figures it out, um, and, and the guy who doesn't? I think the two big things, uh, and they're actually kind of the two things that we just talked about. The first one is there has to be a bare minimum lifestyle. Like <laughs> you have to have, if not a job, like you have to do something like that you actually care about that matters to you. You know, have your own place, um, have a social life, have friends. Um, it, what I discovered over years and years working with clients is that People who did not have that bare minimum lifestyle, living in their own place, job, social support network, education, these things, um, there was just nothing you could do. I mean, and it comes back to that, there's no identity there. Um, If you have a guy who literally does nothing with his life, he has nothing to share. 
<laughs> and so in, in, if you have nothing to share, then no girl is going to be interested in that. Um, so yeah, there's a bare minimum threshold for, for just basic lifestyle. That's the biggest problem. The second biggest problem, I think, comes again back to that, there, that mismatch between uh, who I am and what I value and what I think I want. So um, the classic case of guys that I used to work with or used to see who would just never improve ever would be kind of like your mid-40s professional who's like an IT consultant, a little bit overweight, um, likes to read fantasy novels, <laughs> and he like wants to date a model. And it's like, dude, it, it's either you need to completely like turn your life upside down for this or, or it's just not, or you need to give up the idea that it's going to happen. And that's not saying that you're not good enough because remember, hot models in the club is not a standard of success. Um, it's not saying you're not good enough. It's just she's not buying what you're selling. So you either completely change what you're selling uh, or you, you, you stop trying to sell to them. Um, and so, yeah, you see a lot of those types of guys come in. They usually spend a couple years frustrated. They don't do anything to change themselves. Um, they're like, yeah, I'm an IT consultant and I'm overweight, but she should like me anyway. <laughs> I, I nagged her twice. Why doesn't she like me? Uh, and then they disappear. So yeah. those are the big problems, I think. Right. So it seems like it's, it's really at this identity level change where you're, you're thinking about your values, you're yeah. thinking of um, your own passions and interests. And, um, can we, let's, okay, so we're moving back a little bit to this issue of neediness and values. And now, what about boundaries? Like, that was a big yeah. part of, of that whole uh, concept training, where eventually you get to the point where you've, you've established some values for yourself. Yeah. And, um, and now you're dealing with, with some, you're, you're uh, coming up against some boundary issues. Yeah. Can you explain what, because it's, it's a real, I've never heard this concept in any other uh, PUA material. Yeah. So any other dating advice material. Um, and the way that you put it is different from uh, some of the, the uh, related concepts in psychology. So I think it's really helpful the way you put it. So sure. Talk about that. So rule number one of boundaries is that uh, you are not responsible for anybody else's emotions and nobody else is responsible for your emotions. Uh, and so, and that's simple, like if you can process that, that changes so much, you know, because so, so many guys are like, uh, you know, they get rejected a few times and they think they're hurt because they got rejected. And so they decide like, oh, all the girls in Singapore are bitches. They're t t stuck up, totally entitled, blah, blah, blah. And it's just because they're hurt. Uh, at some point. You know, once you realize, hey, these are my emotions, I'm the one who, responsible for whether I get hurt or not, I'm the one who's responsible for whether I laugh it off, whether I learn from it, it's not her responsibility to like me, it's my responsibility to project myself and, and uh, to present myself in an attractive way. It, you just let go of so much baggage and so much... Um, you know, just an unnecessary struggle and, and, and um, stress that comes along with it. And then the other side of that is that um, if you piss a girl off or, or if, if something happens with, with a girl you're talking to, um, you know, if she decides to react in a really negative way to who you are, um, you know, assuming you didn't violate her or, or do something offensive, um, if you're just presenting yourself honestly and she decides to get really upset and offended by it, it's not your responsibility either. Again, a lot of guys get caught up in like, oh, she got really upset. At, at, I talked about the rainforest and she got really upset. Like, how do I present my rainforest story better so that she'll like me next time? And it's like, no. Who cares? Like, she sucks. Yeah, Don't date cares? her. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, that's not my problem. Yeah. And so... It, boundaries. boundaries, it becomes, boundaries are incredibly powerful in that way. Um, and the thing is, is that women detect those boundaries. Um, they, 
when they realize that they can't really like when they, when they realize that you've decided like what I'm going to accept into my life and what I'm not like when you define for her like look uh, you treat me with respect otherwise like I don't want to date you um, if you establish that they respect you whereas if you don't establish that they don't respect you um, and so it, it's one of these kind of um, self-fulfilling prophecy things where it's like I a value for myself is that I expect people to act respectful towards me or I only spend time with people who are respectful towards me. I express that value. Hey, you just said something I felt was disrespectful. I'm not going to date you if you say something disrespectful. And then suddenly they start respecting you. Yeah. So it's really, that's a really great example because I've yeah. seen this. Um, so that, that's a, a very powerful truth, a fact. I've seen some guys misinterpret this by saying if she, that they're enforce their boundaries to get her to like him, yeah right so then it becomes actually a real boundary problem because you're actually trying to take hold of her emotions yeah. and manipulate them when really it's about like if, if she violates my boundaries you're going to remove yourself or you're going right. to take care of your yourself right and it's really nothing about her like it's she right. violated it, like, you're not going to go punish her or right you are not responsible for her feelings you don't get to decide if she's attracted to you or not you only get to decide who you are and how you react exactly you exactly and 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 the what you just described too it's subtly it, that's another form of neediness yeah. and, and i used to get this all the time with guys they'd be like oh so i should stop being needy so which is <laughs> i care about my own perception so i'll go around and tell every girl that i care about my own perception more than hers <laughs> and it's like no, you're still, no, like you're still <laughs> trying to impress her. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a subtle thing. So it's yeah, subtle yeah. Um, now, I, in, in the Brandon book, The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, in this, on this issue, he raises a really interesting point. He was talking about how he did this presentation in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And they said, um, this is not our culture. Our culture says that you have to take care of the whole community. You fit into the community, you take care of the community. And this is really interesting because this is, Brandon at that point was really old and, uh, you know, he's 80 something. And yeah. That. And, um, you know, I've, I did my PhD in Asian cultures. I've been living in Asia for quite a long time. And it's actually, in a way, true that as a society, Asians have a boundary problem. Right. As a society, at a societal level. Because what they're doing is they're burdening the young, the young generation, uh, with all of the needs and the, the responsibilities and all that, all of the pressure from the older generations. And sure. you need to take care of society. Your personal, individual wants, desires, passions, and dreams need to be subservient to the greater good. Yeah. Right? And, and Ryan, and Ayn Rand is just so against that. So, right. like, Brandon, very, I mean, he didn't really solve the issue, but it was just like a, the last section of this chapter. And, it struck me that that actually is a great way of putting what I'm knocking up against in, in coaching here. Right. Just being here, um, getting getting sucked into that mindset, right. you know, that um, in a way it's, it encourages you to let other people violate your boundaries. Right. For you to violate your own boundaries. And um, it's it was really seeing your formulation of that problem yeah. that made it stark. Right. Yeah. You're not responsible for other people's feelings. Right. Like if your grandmother is crying because you didn't come over for this family gathering, yeah, it's not your problem. <laughs> right. It, and it sounds cold when you like don't have the whole context. It's like, yeah, oh, right. grandma yeah. chose to cry. Right. You know, fuck <laughs> grandma. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, but but there's a whole context that goes along with it, right? So it, it's you know, grandma is crying because she had expectations that you would come over. Um, and, it's like a guilt tripping. Right. And so it's maybe those expectations, if those expe expectations aligned with yours, like if you told her, I'm yeah, going to come over, promise. Grandma, and then you broke your promise and she cried, um, yeah, there's some culpability there. But if your grandma is just totally neurotic and expects you to come over all the time and you don't go over there, um, then it's important to know that like you're not responsible for how she chooses to react you know, you're responsible for your behaviors and how your behaviors align with your relationship or what you say to people. Um, but you're not responsible for their reaction. Yeah. You know, it, it's the same thing of like, you know, if I say something and piss you off a lot and you 
stab me. It's not my fault you stab me, you know, like, and, and you get a lot of people use this kind of reasoning. They're like, oh, well, uh, it's not my fault I hit her. She didn't cook for me. You know, it's like it, it, you see this kind of bizarre reasoning in people all the time. Or like, it, in, oh, it's not, I, it's not my fault I'm late. My wife was yelling at me before I left. No, it's your fault you're late. <laughs> like, it, you're not responsible for, for how other people feel around you. You're responsible for how you react. And they're responsible for how they react. Yeah. So in uh, Singapore, I've had multiple clients who turned down job promotions because their mother doesn't want them to move. Yes. Right. And then I've, I've actually had multiple clients who don't leave the house when they're even under 30 yeah. because their mother would not like it. Yeah. Um, and then those same clients have problems when it comes to girls. Imagine that. <laughs> right? So when the girlfriend or the girl they just started seeing says, we're going to meet at this restaurant, he totally doesn't like that restaurant. Right. And then he says, listen, let's not go there. She's like, no, we're going there. And he gets really, she gets really upset. He caves and he goes. Right. Um, and that's just a trivial example. But there's also uh, documented evidence of guys here carrying girls' purses and, you know, basically just being a bitch. <laughs> um, and I feel like that, that goes all the way through their lives. Like, yeah. It's not just in that one area. It, it's interesting. Um, so I lived in Latin America. I lived in South America for almost two years. And... That culture as well, Latin culture, is rife with boundary infringement. But it's it's uh, it's on the opposite end of the spectrum. Whereas, like, I feel like Asian cultures, like you said, Asian cultures, the boundary infringement comes from they. Asian cultures feel like you should always be giving yourself up to the other person. Whereas Latin cultures say, are so, it's you like you're mine, <laughs> you're mine. <laughs> Right. If you love me, you're not going to leave the house really without it. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. super possessive, yeah. super jealous. Uh, they take offense, you know, to the most ridiculous things. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah it's the yeah. Uh, so on the airplane, I, I've been flying a lot, as, as you have. And yeah. You end up watching movies. There's this one I got. I've seen all the new releases, so I started going to the these Asian movies. I recognized the director, watched this Asian movie, and then I remember why it's been so long since I've watched a non-martial arts Asian. movie. Actually, this was a martial arts Asian movie. Man, it's like Final Man. <laughs> and it still had the the guy, one of the uh, the students of Ip Man or whoever, I forget the actual master, went, um, they got arrested. So he went to the police station and he said, I need you to release this girl. And then the, the Hong Kong cop, the white guy, you know, told me the time. Like, Why? No. Horrible acting. Yeah. No, we're not going to release her. And then he just picks up that that was on the guy's desk and hits himself in the head he said, Bleed. <laughs> and then they cut to the next scene when they release the girl it's like they it's just society glorifies this yeah. uh, like self-sacrifice thing yeah that that's a way to get what you want and it's yeah. really a very childish reaction like yes you're not going to give me that candy boom i'm gonna hit myself in the head yeah um and then just to see it in a movie i just immediately had to stop the movie because it's like polluting my mind <laughs> <laughs> it's emotional blackmail it's yeah, exactly. stuff like that um, you know, it's it's like I'm gonna make you feel horrible until you give me what I want, and it's it's funny because if you did that, say in like a monetary form, like if you said like I'm not gonna pay you five thousand dollars I owe you until you do something I want, like that's a you get in legal trouble for that. But it's like if I'm gonna make you feel like shit for the next month until you do something I want, that scene is culturally acceptable, um, it, and it's a weird kind of standard. The other thing. I, I started to notice the same thing, you know, after I learned about all this stuff. I started to notice the same thing, in, and actually in Hollywood movies from 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, like, if you go back a generation and watch, like, a movie from the 60s, and you watch the love story that happens in that movie, it's so absurd. It's, like, it's, it's stuff like that. It's completely absurd. I actually think some of this has to do, I mean, some of it's absolutely cultural, um, I think some of it has to do in terms of uh, just economic development. Because if you jump back, especially places like Singapore or Brazil, if you jump back a couple generations, for your family to survive, you had to be willing to give up everything for your mom or for your girlfriend or whatever. You had to stay home till you were like 35 years old and give half your money to your parents. Uh, that's how those societies sustained themselves because they were so so poor. And it's the same thing in the West, you know, a couple hundred years ago. Um, and I think it, it's an interesting situation that we have um, 
and actually my few dating experiences here in Singapore, I noticed this here in Singapore as well, where you have the first generation of men and women in some of these Asian, like some of these developing countries or recently developed countries, it's the first generation that they're actually, it's emotionally viable to actually assert yourself in these ways. Um, and, and you're seeing people, like for instance, a common thing that I've perceived here is that you have a lot of professional Singaporean women or Asian women here who are very successful in their careers, but a lot of the the native guys just won't date a girl who's more successful than them. Um, they think it's wrong. Yeah. They think it's that it's bizarre. It just because I, I live around the CBD, right in the middle of it. Yeah. And uh, I've been meeting women there, and three out of four have their own place. Yeah. And they're 27, 28. Right. They're renting some place in River Valley, you know, and um, some of them were dating expats, but right. you know, it was just uh, complete opposite from the local guys. Yeah. And I can imagine how intimidating that would be. And it's the exact same thing in Brazil. I mean, um, you know, a lot of the Brazilian guys, if, you know, my ex-girlfriend, or my ex-girlfriend, my current girlfriend, um, <laughs> edit that out. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry, buddy. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, my current girlfriend, um, <laughs> and she, was, she had a very successful career in Brazil. Um, and she, she struggled with that. Brazilian guys, they struggled dealing with that. Um, they would try, to, like, they would make half as much money as her, and they would, like, force themselves to pay for her. And oh, she's like, this man. is ridiculous. Like, like <laughs> exactly. And they get really upset if she ever tried to, like, um, you know, pay for something or do something. And uh, it, it's, it's a really, I mean, I think it's, it's a cultural shift um, that the West is struggling with still, uh, you know, with all the feminism and, and all these things. Um, but I, I think places like here, uh, places in Asia, places in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, I think that it's like times five because you have this generational struggle as well. You have this generational identity issue. You know, it's like it's the first or second generation of, of people in Singapore or in Malaysia or, or in Thailand who are actually like very like successful and like self-made and, and have their own. And where the, the older generation can, can support themselves mm. without the children just giving a lot of money. Yeah. The way that, yeah. I mean, Singapore developed very, very quickly. Yeah. So that, that, that's a good point. Um, there's this meme or this uh, viral uh, note that went around that Brad Pitt wrote this letter to Angelina Jolie. Have you seen that? No. It's like, so all these girls on my Facebook were sharing it, and it's a hoax. It was a hoax from like <laughs> 10 years ago, but it just started getting revived. And basically, it was Angelina Jolie had all this cancer, and she was miserable and depressed and suicidal, but Brad Pitt wanted to make the marriage work and didn't want to have a divorce, so he loved her into life. Basically, so she rediscovered happiness and everything like that. And the English was really weird, it was, you know, not grammatical. <laughs> so I looked into it as a hoax. And it was really interesting because women, it was only women who shared it. Sure. And they were all like, this is real love. This is love, right? Yeah. And then I was thinking, man, this dude really did this in real life. And she was just like, <laughs> you know, like, ugh. You know what are you doing? Keep it. Well, you know, at the beginning, it would probably be very sweet, but. Um, you know, to love somebody into that right. is, a, is a major example. Is an example of a major boundary problem. Yeah. Um, so, it, it's. Uh, I actually wrote a post last summer called uh, "How Disney Ruined Sex." Oh yeah, yeah <laughs> for everybody. <that's> awesome. <laughs> uh, and it's all about this. It's all about kind of this cultural narrative that we have, like the romance. You know, it's like women are waiting around for some guy to come sweep them off their feet and save them and make them, blow them away. And so they're kind of culturally trained to take a very passive role in their relationships and have all these really high expectations for the men that they meet. And ultimately, this is unhealthy for a lot of different reasons. Uh, men also get a shitty deal, but it's the opposite problem. So men, the cultural expectation is that you're supposed to be the super romantic guy. You're supposed to sweep her off her feet, blow her away, um, do all these amazing things for her, uh, which is where this kind of performing mentality comes from. And, and that creates all sorts of problems for us. It makes us needy. It makes us, um, 
you know, it, it, we we give up our, our own values and identity to try to make her happy and blow her away. Um, and so it just kind of creates a lot of dissatisfaction on both sides. And, um, but it, it's, I think when women see this, I mean, when people, tons of people have said this before, it's like romance novels are porn for women. Um, women react so strongly when they see that, I think, because they kind of get the same reaction we get when we see porn. It's like, none of us would actually date a porn star. None of us would actually, like, <laughs> like, we, like, if you ever thought about, like, the porn that you watch, like, what if that actually happened to you? It's like, you know, you're like, yeah, watching yeah. TV and like three college girls come in and like rape you on your couch. Yeah, right. I, it, it's it looks awesome. It was fun, man. I guess it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and it's like all they care about is sex, and they're just like these horny sluts that are like trashing your place and fucking you left and right. Like it looks awesome, but like in real life, when that actually ha like what happens when you see a girl act, like a trashy girl acting really slutty around you in real life? Like you're like. Ugh, like yeah, right. kind of turned off you know um i it's the same i think it's the analogous to the reaction that women have with that like they see a letter like that and they're like oh my god he gives everything up for the woman he loves and oh and when they, they get it in real life like god what a pussy yeah like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. i wanted to write that in the comments, it's distasteful you know? i just linked the hoax article but yeah, yeah it was it's getting to that point when you real you can start to see it, sort of like the Matrix. You see this in Disney. Yeah. You see it in so many of the romance comedies. Yeah. The guy goes through all these hoops right. to win the love of this girl, and she just sort of waits back. And, you know, did you slay the dragon yet? Right. Um, <laughs> so uh, on that on that subject of the dragon, there's this great point that you made you, you made in an email that um, I, I don't know if you wrote about it in an article, but it was really important for me to see that um, David Dana's book, Where the Superior Man, is sure. a great book. And it's, it was like my little Bible for a couple of years, yeah. every day. And there was a fundamental theme in that book that was about the, the man being the Shiva mm -hmm. and the woman being this, I forget the, the, it's the opposite of Shiva, but this, the goddess, yeah. the, the goddess woman. And sometimes the goddess is this storm of chaos. Yeah. And um, there's this, the Tantra, which is where his background is from, teaches you that, well, the, many Tantra teachers teach that, the, it's the job of the lingam, the male, the male, right. to be straight and upright. You know what I mean? Yeah. Correct. And for the storm to hit it, you know, and, yeah. and the storm really gets off on not being able to move the, uh, you know, the shiva sure. in you, and that if you are turned off by the storm or the chaos, then it's actually a display of weakness in your shiva ness. Mm, yeah. And. Um, you know, just understanding the implications of the point about neediness, about um, values and boundaries and life purpose and so on. Um, it seems like they're at odds. Yeah. And this is a really important thing to get clear on because there's a lot of really great insights in that book, but this is one area that can really lead you into nightmares. Yeah. It leads you straight. Um, so what what is your take on that dynamic? Uh Oh man, I don't even know where to start. Um, so my general take in, uh, on kind of metaphors like that, um, you know, the man's the rock, the woman's the storm, or, you know, I think another one he uses is the man's the arrow and the woman's the force or whatever. Um, I think they're useful. It, you have to be really careful um, in buying into those things too much. I, I think they. I think they're overall, for the most part, true on a broad scale. On a person by person basis, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And I think this is where generally a lot of confusion happens all over uh, dating advice and books, self development books, feminist books, uh, sex books. Is that they take principles that are true over a population and they try to apply it to individuals. So. The problem with applying that metaphor on an individual basis, uh, there's two in particular. One is that while on average men tend to be less emotional and more stoic, and on average women tend to be more emotional and less stoic, uh, those there's always exceptions and there's differences. And you know, you'll see plenty if you meet enough couples, you'll see plenty of relationships where 
the man's the one who's always like flying off the hinge and the woman's the one who calms <laughs> him down. And, uh, and that's fine. Like it, 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 if you kind of buy into that like dogma, you'd say like, Oh, that's not a healthy relationship, but it's, that's perfectly fine. The, the masculine feminine dy dynamic and role, like it, it interacts in a lot of different ways. Um, so that's the, that's the first kind of be wary, but I think the one that you're getting at, uh, and I think that you and I have both experienced, is that it, it, it comes back to the boundary thing where it's, you start accepting a lot of really inappropriate behavior in your life because you think, oh, well, I'm supposed to be the stone that like can take anything, you know? Right. And it's, uh, so instead of, you know, you take a nice concept of like being resolved and being powerful and and uh, being a calming force in a woman's life, and instead interpret it as uh, she can do whatever she wants to me because I have to prove to her that you know I'm I can handle it. You know, uh, and so it comes back. It just becomes another form of performance. It comes. It's another form of neediness. It's like, oh well, uh, you know, she broke my furniture and spit in my face but i'm her stone right. so i'm gonna pretend I'm like i so i don't care you know so she'll she'll see how attractive i am and um and that, people are just miserable like, yeah <laughs> exactly yeah so um so yeah it, it's 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 important to, to to like hold on to that in mind it's like yeah be resolute but be resolute about your values don't be resolute about her behavior. Yeah. I think it's a great metaphor in the sense of, in the sense of, um, the masculine force should be independent and strong. Yes. Stuff. And then the feminine is wanting to lean on it for support, to to have somebody there for her, yeah. and um, to be filled up because she's less fulfilled without this part of her life. I mean, yeah. the more she becomes independent and acting on her own, um, you know, initiative and. Being the leader and dominant, the more she's acting within a masculine kind of yep. uh, role, and that's an important point. Um, but uh, you have—I mean, the, to think about it on these personal conflicts, in these personal conflicts, the better way of thinking about it is to ask the question: Is this a violation of my boundaries? Is this uh, consistent with my values? Sure. Instead of thinking, "Whoa, she's growing up in a storm," like right. you know, the superhero, and uh, I have to be the Zeus god, right. and, you know. Um, because that is a really blunt tool to analyze the situation. Yeah. Well, and one thing I've written a lot about is the um, the the breaker and the fixer pattern. Yeah. Which is uh, um, which is something that's very easy to fall fall into. So it's um, you know if she's constantly causing problems one way that as men we can make ourselves feel needed and feel important and feel attracted is by fixing a girl's problems all the time um but that is it, it's just it's a long it's a terrible pattern to fall into in the long term um, because you're just encouraging these violate these boundary violations further yeah. by fixing them all the time by accepting them and trying to change her and all this stuff so yeah. and all that goes back to this neediness Fundamental neediness, the nice guy syndrome. Exactly. Um, one last thing before we uh, get into the Q&A. Sure. Um, another book that you recommended I read was uh, Bergner's What Do Women Want? And um, I actually am working with people in evolutionary psychology here in Singapore uh, at cool. universities. Nice. And uh, one of them uh, has collaborated with Shivers, Meredith Shivers before. So reading this book, it was just right up against, it went right against the Parental investment theory yeah. that they're pushing pretty much in, in all the books I've read. Yes. Material everything. And there's this, I don't even know how to pronounce it, the plasmograph or something. This device yeah. that has really revolutionized the way we see things in that area. Um, and it seems like evolutionary psychology people are just plodding along, ignoring yeah. it. Um, and the Bergner book I felt was overstated in some ways. Yes, yeah, I agree. Uh, but there's still this point, I mean, like, the, what was really interesting were the interviews that he did yeah. with, um, I'll just grab an example here, the, the women's Viagra, yeah. the, the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of women on the waiting list for this. Why would they want this? And it was really sobering because these are women in their 40s, yeah. and they, they usually will say, I love my husband, but he's like my brother, yeah. and I just can't get the sexual desire going, I need this pill. Um, and then they introduced novelty. 
in yeah. the experiments. And just pure novelty, like just some stranger. Right? <laughs> then suddenly blood flow goes to the vagina yeah, and yeah. she gets all excited. Just some stranger. And then they that goes into the rape fantasies chapter. Yeah. And it's just all this cumulative evidence yeah. um, that women are actually programmed more evolutionary programmed for uh, multiple partners or perhaps that at a certain age they're more responsive to introduction to novelty. Yeah. How do you feel that this <laughs> affects your view on long-term relationships? Uh, I think this is another example of um, where it's very easy to get yourself in trouble by taking things that are true for the population at large, or for, say the population of women at large, or the population of men at large, and when you try to apply it to in individuals, you get yourself in a lot of trouble. Um, I think all of the sex research going on right now, the evolutionary psychology stuff, um, you know, all the, uh, like the, the, shit, I can't even remember, it's been a while since I read this stuff, but this stuff about like polyamory and hunter-gatherer cultures and, um, and then all of like the different, the sexual plasticity of women and all this stuff. Um, I, well, I, all the research I've done on that, I mean, it just seems really clear. The jury's out. Like, all we understand right now is that human sexuality is a lot more complicated than we always suspected it was. Um, obviously, the whole like monogamous um, one partner till death do us part isn't bi a bi our biologically natural state. That's clear. Um, but what's not clear is what is our, bi our natural biological state and how much control we have over our natural because there are plenty of people who are happily monogamous for their entire lives. There are plenty of people who are completely promiscuous and unhappy for a lot of their lives. So I think it's one of these things um, in the same way that, uh, and I, there's no evidence for this at the moment, but this is kind of my personal belief, is that the same way that there's, say, variation in height, variation in strength, there's variation in one's desire for novel, sexual novelty. Yeah, right. um, and so, again, it's like what's right for some people isn't necessarily right for others. And so I, I think with that in mind, I think it's, it's ultimately something that needs to be negotiated within each person's individual relationship itself. Um, so to come to each relationship and say, do we want to be monogamous? Do we want to experiment? Do we want to be polyamorous? Um, do we want to take a break, date other people? These are all personal decisions that people have to make in their own in their own relationships, and it has to be something that you consistently check in on. Um, there was another, I think it was in that book. I don't remember. There was another great example of the. It was like an old couple that had a stale marriage, hadn't had sex in like ten years or something, and. Um, somehow they end up at like a swingers oh, yeah. resort or something and like the the woman who's like 60 years old ends up like getting it on with like a bunch of other women and suddenly and then like the dude starts banging other women and like and it, suddenly they're like crazy for yeah. each other again and <laughs> and they were monogamous for like 40 40 45 years or something like that um so it, it's going to be a personal choice and a personal evolution for each couple um I don't know how nerdy you want to get about this in terms right. of like time. Um, yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. Like, yeah, I might lose some people. Yeah, <laughs> um, hey, this is maybe we could talk about yeah. it over drinks or something. Yeah, but um, yeah. I, I think um, there's um, there's a sex columnist uh, named Dan Savage. In oh US. yeah, sure. Uh, and I'm a big yeah. fan of his. And what's cool about Dan Savage is that, in, in a way, it, it almost makes him like kind of more authoritative on relationships is uh, he was a really, really promiscuous gay guy. He is a gay guy, but like still. But uh, he was really, really promiscuous for a long time. And the gay community is really interesting because it, it's one of, it's kind of the only community that there's kind of no limits to promiscuity. Um, it, it's guys, you know, they kind of let, gay guys will fuck, let each other fuck as many guys as they want. Um, and so his experience in that community kind of gave him an understanding of like where sex and promiscuity ends and where actually like emotional attachment and investment begins. Um, and he, he says, he said many times that what you'll find is 
even across the gay community, across men who are biologically programmed to fuck everything, um, you'll see a lot of men who are far more promiscuous than other gay men. Some gay men are partic particularly monogamous. Some gay men will be promiscuous for a while and then later become monogamous later on in their life. Some men will be monogamous and later become promiscuous. And so ultimately it's a personal thing. And it's something that, but it's a conversation we all need to have to figure our own sexualities out. Like how much promiscuity makes sense for me? Um, how much monogamy makes sense for me? What, what do I need out of my relationship to be happy? And, um, and it'll change as time goes on, but like, Right. And to answer those questions, you have to get out of your, your neediness as well. Yes. Because a lot of the answers to that question, if you're needy, right. are going to be determined by your level of Internal values. metric, internal values. Yeah, you have to like decide for yourself. This, this amount of sex makes me happy. This amount of emotional commitment makes me happy. And right. that's something that only you can figure out. Right. Uh, so that's a good place to, to end the uh, yeah. one So sure. uh, let us give Mark Manson a big hand. And we're going to do it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Welcome back to the Q&A with Mark Manson uh, here in Singapore at the Oregon Academy. Okay, so let's get right into it. Hey Mark, um, my question is, so I guess earlier you were talking about um, setting your own metric of success and not, um, you know, kind of basing it on other people. And, if, and one example you gave with your parents. Also, in one of your um, videos about um, dating as an economy, Mm -hmm. You you came up with a theory of basically um, how how people are conditioned to you know re really depend on their parents' affection, mm -hmm. and to me obviously I think a lot of people you know still um in fact I think most people um when they're kind of older they still um need particular their parents' approval. Yeah. I find that kind of anyone else um it's a lot easier to break their approval you know just consciously. Sure. You know your boss your girlfriend whatever you can replace them. Um, the question is, um, you know, do you think it's achievable and how do you think, you know, you've got that kind of, especially trying to break off um, depend, your dependence on um, meeting your parents' ex expectations? Yeah. You know, when you're in your mid 20s, whatever. I, I think. When you're in uh, should I repeat the question? Oh, because they don't have mics. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, his question was about, in terms of like not. Basing your metric for success on yourself internally, um, what you should do about meeting your parents' metric for success. This might actually be a good one for you because I know <laughs> meeting your parents' approval is a big thing and much bigger thing in Asian culture than it is in Western culture. Um, I think it's a hard process. I think everybody goes through it. Um, I think it's a huge part of becoming an adult is learning how to decide how to do things for yourself and not necessarily because mom or dad tells you to. Uh, one thing I noticed a lot uh, is, you know, I mentioned earlier that I found that when we were talking about guys who just never improve, the one life factor that I found that if this was true, I mean, the guy was just a complete lost cause, was guys who were older who still lived at home. And it, it was like, it didn't matter how smart they were. It didn't matter how cool they were. Um, it's just it, like nothing stuck. Yeah. Nothing worked. And I, I think there's a lot to say about what I kind of discovered after a while is that I think there's a lot to say about that, that independence. That cycle, there's a lot of psychological independence that comes from breaking off with your parents. And, and you notice, too, that a lot of people, a lot of men who have trouble dating, they have trouble, they have poor relationships with their parents as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and so discovering that independence, breaking off from them, you know, obviously we all still want our mom and dad's approval. We all look for it. It feels good. But like at some point you have to decide, this is who I am. This is more important to me. Uh, and I, so I, I think that process is actually, I mean, it, it, it's not a prerequisite, but like it's a huge influence on your dating success. And, and in my experience, guys who have not done that with their parents really struggle a lot <laughs> with, with their, their dating lives. Yeah, you, you, if you have to determine first whether that, like it's a, a good reason to disagree with them or do your thing. If you really believe in it, you're, what you want to do, then it's just a matter of doing it. And then it's down to, there, there are many times in your life 
hopefully, when it's going to be hard for you to have a conversation. Uh, I, think this, I can't remember where I found this, this uh, sentence, but maybe Tim Ferriss. Something like, if you are afraid to have a conversation you know you ought to have, then you can't do anything but have that conversation before you have that conversation. So there could be growing up having to talk with your parents. Um, for me, it was having the divorce conversation. You know, that was when I saw it, like we've been pussyfooting around this issue for years. Um, and then just, there's going to be so many more. And uh, if you don't go through that hard stage, it's like working out and quitting just when it gets painful. Your muscles never grow. What's the point? You're just moving heavy stuff around and you're not getting bigger. Um, so you got to get to that pain point. Can you talk about like what is an emotional knot and what is the process to identify, uh, understand it, and then how do you resolve this emotional knot? So the question was uh, about emotional knots, which is a term I I think I use in my book. Apparently, I don't remember my own book well, anymore. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, but yeah, emotional knots <laughs> is something that I talk about where. Um, some of us have kind of emotional associations with certain uh, experiences or situations um, that we continue to repeat over and over and over again. So a lot of times, um, trying to think of an example, um, for instance, if a guy has like major abandonment issues, he might find that um, if, a, if he texts a girl or calls a girl and she doesn't call or text back within you know, two hours, he starts freaking out and getting like really anxious and nervous and like having all these crazy ideas in his head. Um, and it, it, if it's a recurring thing that seems to always come up time and time again, um, there's some sort of like emotional association or kind of like maybe a, a past traumatic experience um, or really irrational negative belief that's kind of been lodged in the guy's head. So the question is, how do you undo that? Um, the first step is identifying it, obviously. It's like recognizing this is a really messed up, irrational pattern that I keep going through. There's no way to, no, there's no reason to feel this way consistently. Um, and so kind of logically identifying it and why it's irrational, why it doesn't make sense. Uh, and then the, the next thing that you should do is um, decide on, I guess, kind of um, a procedure of behaviors. Um, that you know it's like if if X emotional knot happens, then I know to go do A, B, and C. Um, so just to use like the texting issue, um, you know, if you find like, oh, she hasn't responded, I'm starting to like freak out, get really nervous about it, um, checking my phone every five minutes, then I will decide that my procedure is to A, turn off my phone, B, watch a movie to get my mind off. It. Yeah. And that way you, you can break the pattern and start um, opening yourself up to getting kind of different types of feedback. Because what ends up happening is you find like, oh, well, some women wait a day before they text back. Some women lose their phone or they're busy or, you know, they have a job. Or, um, it, it, so, yeah, there are, there are women with jobs, believe it or not. Uh, if you leave the club, you'll find oh, women in jobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> but anyway, you can start kind of conditioning these new responses into you. You know, once you kind of have these new positive reference experiences, uh, then the anxiety will start to go down, and you'll notice, like, oh, I don't have to turn my phone off anymore. Oh, I don't need to watch a movie. It's not a big deal. Um, so that's, that's kind of a simple, superficial example. Um, but it comes back to the, the first step is awareness. Second step is kind of logically understanding why it's irrational. And then the third step is creating some sort of behavioral procedure that you can habituate into yourself that, that will lead to the positive outcome you want. Yeah, so oh. something like a, like a therapist, would that help a psychologist? Absolutely. Or like meditation, hypnosis, would you recommend any of those? So basically, the so question was therapist, hypnosis, meditation, um, would I recommend them? A absolutely. Actually, 
<laughs> my answer to that question you just asked, uh, it, it's cognitive behavioral therapy 101. It's like if you go to a cognitive behavioral therapist, they will tell you to do, they will work with you to do exactly what I just told you. Um, the whole point is to take kind of irrational negative um, beliefs or experiences or emotions and then slowly kind of condition you to like rewire yourself into having more positive ones. Um, Meditation is always great too. It's, it's, um, it's a, has all sorts of like psychological benefits, helps you relax, helps you gain clarity and self-awareness, understanding your own emotions, becoming less attached to your own emotions. So uh, I, all of those things can be, can be very beneficial. They're not necessary, but they can help a lot. I'm just saying that what I described is CBT. Okay. Um, but I, I don't see any of them as mutually exclusive. So meditation will help you um, get more clarity and awareness about your problems. So I guess you could say meditation will help you with step one. It's like identifying the irrational pattern. Um, hypnosis can, in some cases, can help you kind of like dig back and kind of remove some of the unconscious negative beliefs or negative emotions. Uh, and then CBT is, is kind of the whole, you work through the whole process with a the therapist over a long period of time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, we're doing this guy. Yeah. The question is regarding personal values. You're talking about boundaries, right? Yeah, personal values versus societal values. And it's more around the fact that for a lot of people, as they grow, you start becoming. So eighty percent of society, and you start moving, you start going away from the norm of everyone. Yeah. So an example, an example of, and, and how they deal with it. So an example would be, I mean, like uh, maybe in more of a dating context. It might be, for example, wedding for example, gate crashing a wedding in, in Asia, for example. In, in, not 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 actually gate crashing a wedding. In Asia, there's this concept of when the when the groom wants to marry the bride, they have this tradition where the guy has to go through all kinds of hurdles to show how much he loves the girl. <laughs> On the day of the wedding, you know, yeah. like I don't know, standing on his hands or drinking some drinking some swill or something along that line. It's ridiculous. But the point is, it's 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 tradition, for example, right? Yeah. So, for example, I would assume for for, for many guys, it's beyond a point of be like, this is ridiculous. I don't I don't believe in this nonsensical concept whatsoever. Right. Here is just a win. Take it. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Right, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of work you do that swill, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had the answer. No, but uh, <laughs> but on the side note, I guess I guess the question really is, you know, at at some point your personal values are going to start becoming very different from societal values more and more. Sure. You know, and there is the reality is that there will be a repercussion for holding Absolutely. personal values. Absolutely. Yeah, and I guess I just um, I guess I just want to How do you deal with that? Yeah, exactly. Like Sure. So, one of, I think one of the scary things about identifying these personal values, I should repeat the question. Um, so, the question was, uh, he mentioned specifically in Asian culture, there's a lot of very traditional um, customs and rituals and, and values. And that as you develop your more individual values, that's going to clash with a lot of society's values, maybe your family's values. Um, and that can lead the problems or awkward situations. So how do you deal with that? Um, obviously, it, it depends, case by case basis. Um, I think um, what, I, what I talk about in my book is that you know, the scariest thing, and I think the reason why so many people, so many men resist kind of adopting those personal values, building that identity for themselves, and then portraying that honestly, is exactly what you're talking about. Because once you stand for something, you can piss people off. And when you stand for nothing, you don't piss anybody off, but nobody really likes you either. Mm -hmm. Everybody's just kind of neutral to, to, towards you. Um, as soon as you stand for something, you're going to piss off a bunch of people and you're going to make a bunch of other people really happy. Um, and so what actually ends up happening is, uh, well, first of all, this is really scary. Because, you know, nobody likes rejection. Nobody likes feeling like an asshole. But um, it's actually a really good thing because what happens is you start kind of self-sorting, self-selecting people who also identify with your values and also believe and feel the same things as you. 
in the context, I mean, you, you use the example of a very traditional marriage. In that context, you holding that value that that's a little bit ridiculous and antiquated and unnecessary uh, will eventually lead you, if you express that value openly, that will eventually lead you or likely lead you to a woman who thinks it's a little bit ridiculous and antiquated and unnecessary, uh, which then is just makes you a better couple. And besides, when, and when you get married with her, you don't have to do all that stupid stuff. Um, so that's how it works practically. That's, why it's, that's how it's a good thing practically. I, I think when it comes to kind of social customs or social rituals um, in particular, I think every culture kind of has a bunch of uh, rituals like that, that left over from previous eras um, that made sense. Like that kind of marriage made sense hundreds of years ago because, um, you know, mar a marriage was like an economic transaction. Um, so the man had to prove himself. Uh, but today, it kind of, it really, it's more just symbolism. It's more just, the tradition exists just for the sake of tradition. The tradition just exists because, hey, this is what everybody else has always done, so let's do it too because it's fun. Um, so I, I think you can kind of look at it in a different way. I understand why that kind of stuff can piss you off. Like we were saying, like some of those movies, like piss, like I can't stand a lot of like romantic movies now like because it's just, it's so ludicrous to me. Um, but I think in a more practical terms, like when dealing with like customs and traditions like that, like look for some sort of other value in it. You know, it's like, yeah, this is based on a life philosophy that's completely ridiculous and goes against my values. Um, do you want to get that? <laughs> but um, but I can still find value in it. You know, I can bond with my family and bring people together and have a good time or whatever. So that's what I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, if your value, if you really believe very strongly against it, I think it's a great point that if uh, you express that enough, the friends around you should understand where you're at. You would attract and keep the type of friends who would also share those values. Um, it's, I think it's pretty natural. If you get stuck in a situation where it was like a shotgun wedding and her family is like being jerks and they want to torture you or haze you, tough luck, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing about relationships is like sometimes you just have to sacrifice things <laughs> make the in-laws happy pull the fire alarm just clear the <laughs> alright so we're going to come back to this side um, yeah so you, your blog now is very successful you know um, fellow followers um, but I think you mentioned how you know, you've been for six years and obviously you were it wasn't it hasn't taken off straight away my question is what were some of the so the question was about my blogging career. Uh, my site's very popular now, markmanson.net, by the way. Um, yeah, it's so what are the big turning points in terms of the blog? You know, it, I get this question a lot, and I, I never know how to answer it. And it's this funny thing about, like, human nature. And I guess you could kind of, like, it's the same thing with, um, you know, when guys say, like, oh, you're really good with girls now. What were your turning points? And it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, um, it's such a, when you have something that's such a long, slow evolution over, like, four years, six years, eight years, um, I, the human brain naturally just kind of, like, looks at the result and says, like, okay, what, what happened to make that result? When it was just a million little things, um, I can't think of one big thing. Um, Just to clarify the analogy. Um, sure. So, so if you think about, like, in terms of the history and all, say, the World Series of Poker, and you can think of how uh, the crew spider man you know, winning it, yeah. um, all of a sudden catapulted his popularity, even though all the world's been there, you know. Yeah. Was there anything that happened kind of that skyrocketed or Switching away, switching to gender neutral was the biggest thing. Um... I guess, okay, so if I had to pick a couple things, switching to gender, my, a, a gender neutral brand was actually one of the biggest things, not only just because 
women felt comfortable reading all this stuff. Um, but people, men felt weird about sharing men's self-help with other, like publicly. So as soon as it wasn't about men's self-help anymore, men's dating, men actually felt very comfortable talking about it and showing it to people. Uh, so that really helped take things off. Um, and the other thing it would just be models, my book. Um, and it actually, when I released it, it didn't really make a big splash or anything. But slowly and steadily over the years, um, it just keeps getting recommended more and more and more to people. It keeps showing up on, on Reddit and different forums. Um, and that, that just has major... And it's funny, it's all in the background, so I, I don't see any of it. It's just, I know that thousands of people are reading it, and the people who read it uh, like it they like it enough that they just they stick with me. They don't, I don't necessarily hear from them or talk to them, but they're reading, they're paying attention, they're there in the background somewhere. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, then we had this question here. Uh, uh, yeah. In your book, uh, you talk about these two ideas. The female attracted by the man, the higher sector. Yeah. So more, more, it's more like a more the man is more happy. We are talking about also female are aroused by men who desire them. Yeah. So this one is more attractive for the man. Yeah. So attraction, when you start at attraction, you put these two together and say sex paradox. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's it's confusing. So the question is, uh, in the first chapter of my book, um, I state two things. I say that female attraction is based upon social or perceived status, um, perceive or perceived dominance, and then sexual desire comes from a man who demonstrates desire um, for the woman. Uh, I think I actually, I, I actually address this at some point in the book uh, because it does look contradictory. And it, um, the, the kind of the misconception though is, is it, it's only contradictory when you look at it at specifically as like surface level behaviors. So it's like, okay, so I have to be high status so I have to act like I'm cooler than her. But if I'm cooler than her, I would never show her that I want her. Um, whereas the status thing actually comes down to neediness. It's all about your mindset. The status is not based on how you perceive her, it's how you perceive yourself. Um, so the way to kind of resolve that contradiction is to pursue women without being attached to the outcome. Uh, it's like if I know that I'm a high status guy and I want to date this girl, if she rejects me, then I know that that's not like, oh, well, I'm a high status guy. It's no problem. Um, if I'm a low status guy, then I'm going to try to control her reaction to me. I'm going to try to pursue her in such a way where she can't say no. Um, and so kind of the way to resolve, the, resolve that paradox is to pursue women in a way that's unconditional. You're not looking for a response. You're pursuing women in a way that is a natural expression of who you are and what you want. Whereas a low status guy pursues women as something that will try to f make himself feel better. You know, try to hide who he actually is. Does that make sense? That's great. Unconditional. That's a good word. For this yeah. Because when a guy approaches girls with conditions, that's when he freaks out when she's rude to him. He thinks yeah. it's an affront to himself. Right. He goes and blows out. Uh, yeah. I think you read this one in this relationship article. Yeah, so I just want to ask, like, uh, in the relationship, sometimes you actually fall into this uh, context of, like, co-dependence. How do you actually set the boundaries between your own personal boundaries and compromise? Right. 
I think those are actually, so the question is, when you're in a committed relationship, um, to not fall into a codependent state, um, and a, code, a person who's codependent bases their happiness on the person that they're with, uh, solely the person that they're with. Um, how do you define your boundaries, but also be willing to compromise? I would say deciding what you're willing to compromise about is actually a part of defining your boundaries. So there are things in my relationship with my girlfriend that I'm okay compromising on. I'm okay sacrificing. Um, just simple example is like, um, you know, if she's having financial problems, I'm comfortable sacrificing and helping her out. Um, if she really needs to go back to Brazil for some reason, and I don't really want to go, I'm okay compromising and going with her. Um, but then there are also things that I, I will not compromise about and I'll never compromise about. For instance, um, disrespectful behavior, uh, lying, manipulation, taking advantage of me, all these things. So it's, again, it's one of those things that it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. You have to decide for yourself what, what your limits are so, for instance, I don't mind financially helping my girlfriend, but if we go two and a half years and she's draining my bank account, like, I, at some point I have to, like, draw a line and say, okay, this is my limit, this is my boundary. So, the compromise question is, is a part of that. It's a part of all of that. Um, and the, the key thing, so the terms I use uh, typically is... Um, People who are very needy, they fall into two camps. Um, there are people that are narcissistic, which means they only care about themselves um, and treat the other person like crap. Then there are codependent people who only care about the other person and they treat themselves like crap. And the goal is to care about yourself and care about the other person. You know, Hold both of your needs and both of your happinesses uh, in a high regard and not and find ways that you can meet both of them um, without sacrificing one for the other. Yep. Yeah. Question. Um, what do you think are uh, like the stages of a relationship, I guess? Like how does it evolve? Like in society Ooh. now, like we're taught or we're told that like marriage is like the ultimate thing. Yeah. How do how do relationships evolve? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I think it's going to be different for everybody. I think, generally speaking, um, God, this is something I wrote years ago. Let's see if I can remember it. I think generally kind of the process of a relationship is, like one thing I used to say back in my pickup days is that things are always escalating. If things are not escalating, they're, they're dying. Um, and in the beginning, the escalation occurs both physically and then through like communication, like lear learning more about each other. Um, as the physical escalation kind of like peaks you know, at sex, sexual relationship, the escalation has to continue. It has to be emotional escalation. Um, developing deeper deep, and deeper, uh, more personal, more profound feelings for one another. And then as that emotional escalation continues, eventually you kind of reach the point where you know everything about each other, you know how the other person ticks, you know how they feel about things, you know their habits, and... Um, and then at that point, the escalation, it has to actually become a merging of lifestyles, um, which means you have to both kind of be on the same path and in the same direction. Uh, so you both have to want to live in the same kind of place and do the same kind of activities or have, find a nice co compromise between the things that she does and her friends and the things that you do and your friends. Um, and then if you're on that path together for long enough, then you can get married or, or um, I think at that point it just becomes something that you are constantly reevaluating and, and rebuilding. Because if one of you kind of deviates, it's like, oh, I got a job in Russia, 
<laughs> by, um, you know, that causes problems. So um, it's like keeping your, yourselves kind of aligned with one another, um, keeping each other updated with each other's life. And I guess that's kind of how it perpetually goes. And then marriage, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about marriage. <laughs> well, you were saying it's the combination, but uh, when you get married, you realize it's just to start. You know, now you got another, what, 50 years or so, depending on how healthy you are. <laughs> it's just to start. Yeah. yeah. I've never been married, so. <laughs> okay, last question. Yeah. Just going back on that question on resolving emotion lots. So next to the cognitive behavioral therapy, is there anything else you want to <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just going to hit that, Elliot. Uh, uh, so it's sort of like we're giving you, you're asking for the one workout, right? I'm like, you can do squats, man. Squats are great. You train the core, the your legs, you know? It's great. And you're like, can I just do squats and only squats? Uh, well, we threw in, you know, a bunch I'm, of other I'm just wondering if there are any other ones that were on the You mean, the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I just, yeah. Um... <laughs> I'm sure there are. I mean, there that that's kind of like asking how many types of workouts there are. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some. I mean, psychotherapy could be useful. Um, pharmaceuticals, anti-anxiety drugs. I mean, yeah, any form of um, any, any form of therapy or or um, system of development could be applicable. It's going to be different for everybody. I. I I think that's something that gets lost too, is that different forms, different therapeutic forms um, and different solutions to people's problems uh, are better and worse for different people. Um, some people respond very, very well to, say, psychotherapy. Some people respond very, very well to meditation. Some people respond very, very well to pharmaceuticals. So figure out, okay. yeah. Okay, last question. This is the last I've got a one. Um, so you were talking earlier not being the biological predisposition of men and women anymore. And the, the research, the voting stuff, right? Um, what keeps you, personally, just intrinsically as a, as a guy, what keeps you in a relationship? Keeps me in a relationship? Um, On a personal level. Yeah. yeah. So what I, I like to say, so the question is, what keeps me in a relationship? Uh, like a committed relationship. One thing I like to say about relationships is that entering a relationship should be an emotional decision. Leaving a relationship should be a logical decision. Uh, and most people do it the other way around. They enter a relationship because they think it's a logical thing to do. Um, and then they leave a relationship because they get really pissed off and they're emotional. Uh, what I found, because I, was, I, I went through a number of years where I was very promiscuous, and I always kind of struggled with like how much I wanted to see each woman, if I wanted to stay, like if I was open to be monogamous with them or what have you. What I started to discover is that, both with my ex-girlfriend and my current one, is that uh, as the months would go on with them, I would naturally become less motivated to see other women. And it wasn't because I felt obligated to see her. It wasn't because I felt... Um, it was ethically right or wrong. It was just simply suddenly it'd be Friday night and it'd be like, you know, I don't really want to go out. I just want to see this girl again. And um, eventually that would grow to the point where I didn't really want to see other women. And so that's my metric for being with a woman. Um, what do I get out of my relationship? I, I, I get a lot. The value is... A lot of it's tangible, a lot of it's intangible. A lot of it is just, it's awesome having kind of unconditional emotional support for the things going on in my life. I mean, there's like, that's something that you can't put any sort of like value metric on that. Um, I, I, more tangible things, um, it's cool having a friend to party with all the time. It's cool having a hot girl to have sex with all the time. Um, it's cool to have a really smart person to bounce my ideas off of. You know, it's like sometimes I come up with an article idea and I 
tell it to my girlfriend, and she's like, no, <laughs> don't write that. Like, oh, okay. Um, so yeah, that's what I get out of it. Yeah, relationships are awesome. Um, fucking tons of girls is awesome. Yeah. So it's just because one the the natural biological way is different from the choice you've made. Uh, like it's you're, there seems to be an assumption that the, the descriptive is is the normative, right? Yeah. So exactly. there are a lot of biological. I mean, like the natural way of things is for us to be walking around like hunting stuff, you know, and <laughs> hunting our food. You know, that's the natural <laughs> thing. Like cook, you know, uh, many of the much of our modern way of life is unnatural. You know, air conditioning is unnatural. You can give it up because it's not natural. You know, so, <laughs> so we develop, we have all brains so we can do these things. Yeah, and what, what gets lost in this conversation a lot is that uh, deep, lifelong emotional attachment is also biologically natural for us. So, and this is kind of nature's cruel joke on humanity, is that on one level, on a reptilian level, we're programmed to fuck as much as we can. And on a mammalian emotional level, we are programmed to become very deeply attached and committed to certain individuals in our lives. Uh, so figure that one out. Yeah, that's great. So on that note, <laughs> uh, let's thank Mark again for coming by. And, uh, Thanks, dude.